Okay, hello everybody. We're uh, gonna do one of these again and I'll keep it under the time so we can go, uh, um, so this could can be posted. So we're gonna start, this is the next part of the unit. Next part of unit one is the constitution. Um, there'll be one more part before the test. So, and this will be divided up into different parts itself. So this is just part one of the constitution. Okay, so we gotta talk about the origins of the constitution. We're actually not gonna quite get to it today. We're going to talk about a couple of documents and then the and the origins, of course. So let's start with we have to kind of understand what a constitution is. So a constitution is, and this is a generic definition, a nation's basic law. Okay, any nation that has one, it should be their basic law. It creates the political institutions that uh, are made up in the country for whatever, however they decide to create them. Um, it allocates power within the government. Um, which, of course, is what ours does, and this all, of course, applies to ours as well. Um, it often, again, ours does, provides guarantees for citizens, and we'll see that as we go through the Constitution, excuse me, and the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> and it can also have unwritten traditions and precedents. If you look at uh, some of these uh, um, areas around the world, like Great Britain, they actually have a, a certain part of their Constitution if you want to call it that, is unwritten. Um, it, it relies on traditions that date back um, long, long ago, thousand years or so. Okay, so this is going to be the lead up to the revolution in one slide. Most of this, of course, is from U.S. history last year. <clears throat> um, a series of taxation and other oppressive laws after the French and Indian War is what happened. That encompasses all the things like the Stamp Act and the Tea Act and the, and the Intolerable Acts and a variety of other things um, that lead up to 1776. Um, and throughout the 1770s, because of these, discontent is going to grow and grow. Um, one of the big things is, and this is the idea, like one of the big things we hear, of course, is no taxation without representation. And that was true. There was no representation in the creation of these laws excuse me, was a major issue. And that is really what they're, they're end up fighting for. They want to be part of parliament. Um, in 1775 and early 1776, there was sporadic fighting, you know, Lexington and Concord and a variety of other things um, through uh, the rest of 1775 and then 1776 um, before the Second Continental Congress then decides, of course, to separate from England. <coughs> excuse me. So then we get to, of course, the Declaration of Independence, which is the first of our nine foundational documents. If you go back to the introduction to the course, um, we'll have nine of these foundational documents that we have to talk about and you have to understand to be able to answer the, um, the uh, um, argumentative essay on the exam. Plus, you do need to know this stuff, of course, anyway, for the course. So the things to know about the Declaration before we look at some specific parts is it's a philosophical and political document. It both sets out, the first thing it lays out, a philosophical basis for independence. Um, and that is essentially the first part, um, or sometimes labeled the first two parts of the Declaration of Independence. In addition, the political side is, is the justification. And there's a long list, some 57 separate things, uh, something of that nature, um, listing abuses by the king um, that compel the um, the the colonies to separate. So it lays out the philosophical basis and then it justifies it. That's the political side. It justifies it by listing these, these huge amount of things that the king has done um, that so much so that we just have to separate. And we'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Um, it is to me, um, it is the most, but it's perhaps the most or one of the most important and succinct philosophical statements of government ever written. We'll talk about some of the most important parts, and your homework assignment is also um, talking about some of those most important parts. So let's look at some of the important parts. Um, first of all, we have to understand it's founded um, mostly on the ideas from the English heritage. The vast majority of the colonists had, or were living at least, under an English heritage. It had been since 1607. So it's not surprising that most of their ideas come from the heritage um, left behind or still there, of course, by by the English. Um, John Locke is the the primary uh, philosophical source 
for the Declaration of Independence for um, Thomas Jefferson and those on the committee who helped him write it. Um, and his ideas are in the late 1600s or, or the late 17th century. Um, that's him there. Um, first of all, it's the idea of natural rights. Very, very important concept, the idea of life, liberty, and property. Those are the natural rights, according to Locke. And Jefferson will, of course, change that last one. Um, but we have these. They're called natural rights. It's very important to understand the rights don't come from government. They don't come from some other source. The only place they come from is they're called natural rights. So if you believe in a god or a deity, they come from God. If you don't, then they come from nature. Either way, they're yours because you're human. You're a human being, and, and your rights are there. They're natural rights because of what you are. They don't come from somewhere else. And again, it's government's job, and we'll see that, to protect these rights. And then life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness become those unalienable rights that Jefferson writes about. Um, a little bit more, consent of the governed is another concept in there, and this is not part of the notes, just this is a quote from the document. You can see where that comes from. It's also a document of limited government, and you can see that by that long list of abuses um, that are attributable to the king. Um, so saying that that's government does too much. Also the idea of the right to revolt. And again, the long quote from there, um, and you can read this uh, in the declaration itself, uh, that um, government, um, that it's, it's the right, it's the, uh, it's the duty to overthrow a government that is not doing its job. And its job is to protect those natural rights. That is the idea here. And the government of Great Britain was not doing that. Okay, so let's move on to another one of our article, our, another one of our documents. Um, this will be your assignment um, for Thursday, Friday, um, is the Articles of Confederation. So we're going to move ahead here real quick and get to the point where the Constitution is um, about to be created. So we'll start the second part. So Articles of Confederation, if you remember from your uh, American history last year, um, it was the first, essentially the first government, the first actual constitution with a small c um, for the United States. It was a written document that, that set up the governmental powers. Um, it was in effect, or not in effect, but it was the document started in 1776, but it didn't go into effect. It wasn't ratified um, by enough states until 1781, but it was the governing system all the way through 1787 and 1788 before the Constitution becomes um, the law of the land. And the idea, remember, who dominates, and this is a, the Articles of Confederation, is the states. The states dominate the Articles of Confederation. Um, and the reason is very, very important. The reason is that they feared a strong central government because that's what they're trying to get away from. And in 1781, that is what they got away from. So that was a very strong central government. So they were looking to make sure that didn't happen again. Very, very important concept. Um, and now what we mainly need to know about the Articles of Confederation is the weaknesses that, that it created. So let's look at that. Number one, no power to tax. Um, while we none of us like taxes, taxes are a reality that have to be there. Um, remember, it was taxation without representation. It was not taxation, period. So Congress had to request money from the states, and there was no way to force the states to pay up. So that's a weakness because the states never gave the full amount. States gave some but never the full amount and usually not on time. The um, government could not regulate trade. The national government could not regulate trade. And that was really important because the regulation of foreign trade was necessary for the development of the national economy. Um, what was happening was all of the states were waging economic war. That's what's underneath my picture there. Um, waging, the states were waging economic warfare with each other. And it was all about foreign trade and regulating interstate trade, and they could not do that. And that was causing the economy to take a dive. In addition, it was extremely difficult to pass laws. It took nine states to approve of a law to be passed. Now, if we think about that, if we think about our legislature, it only takes a majority, majority in the House, a majority in the Senate to pass laws. So. Um, this was this is more than a majority. It makes it difficult to pass laws. In addition, it was also virtually impossible to amend. Um, all of the states had to approve, and there's no way that you're going to get all 13 states to agree to amend the document. And it was that therefore it made it impossible to fix it. 
They knew there were issues that they had to fix, and they couldn't fix it this way. There was no national court system, so essentially no judicial branch for, for the country. It relied on the state courts only. The executive came from Congress, which means the executive was a member of Congress, just selected by Congress to be the president. And that means they didn't have very much power because they just did what Congress wanted. It was basically just like having Congress run the country. The only real success, and if you remember this from your American history, um, organizing the West, like the Northwest Ordinance, and creation of new states. Those things were the um, important successes, so you need to know that as well. But make sure you know the weaknesses, because that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to be changed um, when we have the Constitution. And the last part of it for today is the post-war problems that lead up to it. There was a depression after the war. After most wars, there are usually depressions or economic downturns. And the fact that the states were waging economic war with each other created massive economic turmoil and massive post-war depression. And they were trying to deal with that. In addition, the last straw, we'll call it, Shays Rebellion, it was Massachusetts farmers were trying to stop the judges from foreclosing on their farms. So they were making sure the judges could not sit because they owed money to the eastern part of Massachusetts. These were the western farmers and they couldn't pay it because of that economic turmoil. So they're being foreclosed on. So Daniel Shays, a Revolutionary War captain um, from Massachusetts, led this little rebellion. And in the beginning, neither the state nor the national governments could assemble a militia to stop it. Um, and eventually they ended up stopping it with some form of a small militia and, and hiring some soldiers as well. Um, and in the end, that is the last straw. So this is the last thing for today. Um, the Shays Rebellion, we have to understand, is the last straw in that dissatisfaction, which had happened since 1781 with the Articles of Confederation and their weaknesses. So um, you end up with Shays Rebellion, com Rebellion, excuse me, compelling the next step, which is where we'll start the next lecture. So um, we are done with this for today, so thanks for paying attention, and we'll see you um, on Thursday with another one.